He believes in giving back to the society. One thing he says, you cannot leave this world with, and that is knowledge. My name is Dr. Masi Korir, and on this episode of Doctor's Diary, Professor Mansour talks about his drive and motivation in medicine and specifically oncology. Professor Mansour always walks around with a Mont Blanc pen. And I used to wonder, why is it so expensive? Why would a Mont Blanc be so expensive? It's not the refill. I, it is, this is gold plated. And, I, and that's why I think, you know, I, I forget many things. This one I don't forget. Uh, and very often, you know, I put it here. And the other day, I came home. I'm searching myself. I couldn't find it. I thought, oh, after all these years, I lost it. But there it was, hanging on, the, on my wardrobe, stuck to my shirt. <laughs> For 40 years now, it's a pen he says he cannot afford to lose. This Mont Blanc pen was given to me by my father as a gift. Uh, it was, must have been an important birthday. You know, Mont Blanc pens are important pens. And I usually lose pens every time. But this one I have not lost because I have very bad handwriting, so it has not helped my handwriting. But it's a memory of my parents who gave me the ability to become who I am today. And that, you know, there is, and it, it is very important. You ask me, you know, the word in Islam, in a Muslim Arabic language for writing is called Ikra, I-Q-R-A. That is right. Um, or it says also read. And that is the motto for the Chancellor for the AKU, I standing for impact, Q standing for quality, R for relevance, A for access. So when I write, regardless of ineligible my prescriptions are, I'm reminded that those are the four words that make a difference and that is part of my, that is what I need to contribute to get the, with everybody else. Impact, quality, relevance and access. And maybe this expensive pain, which I hope I will not lose, will remind me about that, yes. To him is a symbol of what his father accomplished through him, a professor, physician, and cancer researcher. A meeting with Professor Mansour, be it during such an interview or when just catching up about his cancer researches and plans, is always memorable. He is well-spoken, eloquent, passionate about advancing cancer, and definitely witty. In Europe, downtown, Stadtmitte, is where you go to do shopping, etc. When you knew, you go to Stadtmitte. So I was at Henry Ford Hospital. It was probably at that time the biggest hospital in North America, a thousand beds in the periphery of Detroit. And so I go to the watchman who, at the building where the students were staying. He says, I want to go shopping. I want to go to downtown. He looks at me and says, downtown? Are you sure? He says, I'm sure, I want to go shopping. How will you go? He says, I'll take the bus. He says, you know, I lived here for 20 years. I don't go to downtown, I don't take the bus. <laughs> but yes, I took the bus, number 67, from Henry Ford Hospital downtown, and I took it back right away because downtown was a really a thug town. <laughs> the Henry Ford Hospital where he was, he says, was like an oasis that cushioned him from the cultural shifts in America happening all around him at the time. When I see this here, this university, a cosmopolitan place, different people, ethnicities, different cultures, different religions, we all get together. I think knowledge brings us together. So I consider myself African at heart, but by American in, uh, in, in, in at least the way I behave because I like to challenge the status quo. Kesho does not count, it has to be Leo. <laughs> and uh, my sense is, no is not quite acceptable to say, why not? And how can we change? How can we change? How can we make things better? Are the constant questions that linger in the mind of Professor Mansour, the 68-year-old director of the Cancer Center at the Aga Khan University Hospital in Nairobi and chair of the Hematology Oncology Department. Even if we could not have done it before, why not? Let's try to do it. And I think that's, that notion that yes, we can is important. And the same thing holds for cancer research. 
there was no cancer research being done in East Africa or Sub-Saharan Africa. It's been done in South Africa, Alexandria, but those are not African patients. Today, we can say we can do it as well as any North American or European research unit. But his journey to being one of the world's top cancer doctors and researchers was not easy. Born in Zanzibar, a mix of goodwill, luck, and hard work have seen him achieve quite a lot. But his drive to be a doctor came from an unusual inspiration. People go into medicine because of an inspiration. Uh, they had a loved one who was ill and they saw they were suffering. They want to do something about the suffering. They see the world suffering. They want to do, make a change. I didn't have any of those loadable goals. You know, I had asthma as a young child and my uncle was a surgeon who was probably the first surgeon in Tanzania. So I had to go to his uh, clinic to get shots when I get asthma, so probably steroid shots. And he was trained in Britain, and in Britain, you get all these letters after your name. So he was Amir Alidina, MBBS, FRCS, DTLO, and something else. I said, wow, I want a name like that. I want a big name. And that was the impetus for me to become a doctor. But then when I go to Germany and America, you can be a specialist in many fields, you just get medical doctor, MD. So in many ways, I'm a simple MD, despite all the things I've studied. Although because of where he trained and worked previously, he hasn't gotten many initials after his name, his experiences and lessons learned are numerous. In the culture of those days, a parent is beholden to their parent. So when my father, he was the youngest, he had a child. My grandparents, which are his parents, were alone at home because all their children, my father, my uncles, had already left home. So my father tells my grandmother, my firstborn will be yours. It's a cultural tradition. So I'm the firstborn. So I am given to my grandparents to take care of. You can imagine that my mother probably wasn't happy about that, to see her firstborn is going to be given to a mother-in-law. But yes, I was born in Zanzibar. My grandparents lived in Zanzibar. And I was taken care of by them until the age of about six or so, when the revolution occurred. And I'm a child of the revolution. I was just like in the revolution. I was captured by those soldiers who were uh, revolting. I was put in a prison for a few days in a camp for about four or five days by myself. That was an experience as a young child. So today when I hear about the war and refugees and young child being displaced, I know what it feels like. But after that, I went back to the mainland, Dar es Salaam, where my parents were, and I was united. So then I lived in Dar es Salaam. I went to high school in Iringa, in Kwawa High School, in southern part of Tanzania. I came to Nairobi to do my A-levels, and then I left Nairobi to go to Germany to do my university training. His experience as a victim of a revolution exposed Mansoor early on as a child to the evils of war. This may have shaped him to being compassionate and empathetic with a desire to always alleviate pain and suffering. Every day was a struggle. You wake up, you've got soldiers around you, you get your food, it's dark all the time. I wasn't quite sure what would happen, uh, but there was a sense that my grandfather was also captured at the same time the two of us, he was somewhere else. I was sure that somewhere he or the community of which I was part of would come and rescue me. And I got rescued a few, I think about four or five days later. I never knew what happened to the others. You depend upon your parents, in this case my grandparents, to be your main um, supporters and really your pillars. And when all of a sudden you have no one in a stranger environment with other kids who also were captured, uh, it makes you very vulnerable and it makes you realize that there is humanity because there were people who were good to us despite being in despair. So as I see today, children displaced. There are people who misuse and abuse them, but there are also people who out of the goodness of the heart would either adopt them or take care of them. So I saw both sides of the world at a very young age. Mansoor says that his rescue by the Ismaili community and being reunited with his parents taught him a lesson that it is important to be part of a community. His coming to Kenya at a time when Tanzania had become a socialist nation set the ball rolling for his various experiences in different parts of the world. His next stop was Germany. 
My father used to sell Makonde art in Tanzania, and there was a German author who liked the artwork, and he would come and buy the artwork and the Makonde sculptures from my father. And he would, my father would take him all the way to southern Tanzania to meet the Makonde tribes who put, who uh, made these sculptures. He would ask him the history of the, uh, the uh, family tree, what kind of sculpture this is, what it meant. And a few years later, this German author who became an author about Makonde art and probably had the biggest collection of Makonde art outside Africa, told my father that, why don't you let me educate your son? And uh, so this man, who was a business partner, a business colleague of my father, took me to Germany, educated me like I was his child. I was like his son. And I lived there for eight years. It was a formative period of my life where a poor, a total stranger would take ownership of someone out of the goodness of their heart. And uh, I then became a physician. But after eight years of stay and before leaving Germany to the U.S., his benefactor would surprise him. A lesson he has pauses in his life. When I was buying Makonde from your father, he used to tell me, don't give me the money, you keep it, I will need it someday. This is the money that I owe your father, this is yours to take. So this is the goodness of the world that I experienced. And it's clear that I have no choice in many ways to pay back the goodness that was given to me that made me a physician. So he took care of me, I went to medical school uh, in Germany, and he was like a parent to me, and I lived there for a long time. And that made me in many ways who I am today. From here, his next stop was North America, Detroit, Michigan. I was surprised that, that I left uh, Germany. I could have stayed there. It was home to me. But my parents, in the meantime, immigrated to Canada. And I said, I owe them a presence because many, in many ways, they were the ones who enabled me to get this education. And my uncle, who was the one who inspired me because of the long name, said, if you want to study and get the best of medical education, you should go to North America, which is North, the U.S. My parents are in Canada. He says, go to the U.S. So I found a place which is the closest to Canada, which is Detroit. Detroit is at the border of North America and Canada. And if you know what Detroit was about 30, 40 years ago, it was a gangster town. So I live this idyllic city called Heidelberg where I went to medical school and come to Detroit, a thug town. You talk about cultural shift. This was a cultural shift. But even in D Detroit, that's where I met my future mentor who talked about targeted therapy of cancer. And he came to give a talk in Detroit. He was a professor at the University of Michigan. And I got a fellowship to do research in Michigan at the University of Michigan in Arbor, which is about two hours away from Detroit. And as, a, as before I was to start, he sent me a letter to say, I'm moving to Alabama because I become a head of the cancer center. I come from Africa, trained in Germany, come to America, I have no clue where the hell Alabama was. I look at the map to say, where is Alabama? So I said, no, you know, I will go wherever you're going because I want to train with you because I want to do targeted therapy of cancer. So I go to Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama, University of Alabama, and I am received at the airport by a young woman who was his assistant in a red pickup truck and a gun in the holster. Welcome to Alabama. So that is Alabama. Uh, but you know, people were good to me. I was there for nearly 20 years. Everything I know about research and cancer, I learned from my mentor, El Labulio, who was at that time the head of the cancer center in Alabama. What he had seen and learned at the Max Planck Institute, a world-leading science and technology research organization in Germany, where he trained as a medical doctor, lay the foundation for his stab at cancer research. The Max Planck Institute is like the NIH in Germany. Nearly 90% of the Nobel Prize winners in Germany come from the Max Planck Institute. So I saw a number of famous names, and there was one person by the name of Heinz Kohler. He received a Nobel Prize at the age of 40. And he developed proteins that would target specific cells. So it's like a targeted molecule. And there was a Nobel Prize given about 40 years before to Paul Ehrlich, who coined this protein 
call it the magic bullet, the magische Kugel, that this bullet will go and target this particular cell and spare all of the cells. I said, wow, that's fantastic. You can develop this molecule that targets a specific cell. So I remembered that, but I didn't think much about it. I come to America, and there's a professor who comes and gives a talk about targeted therapy of cancer, the magic bullet that would treat cancer, kill cancer, spare normal tissue. I said, well, that's what I want to do. And I said, that's the research I want to do. So it was like an awakening, predisposed by what I learned in Germany, the Nobel Prize winners, the ideas. And then I said, that's a vocation that is worth pursuing. As a physician taking care of patients and impacting their lives, Professor Mansour says new knowledge, however, comes from research and thinking about the solutions needed tomorrow. And the reason I came to Africa was research is done in North America, in other places. The drugs we use and develop there are used by our patients here, but they've never been studied in our patients. We do not know whether they will work for us. And I think we should do that work here. And that's what brings me here. Between his busy schedules, Mansoor finds time for family. My wife was born in Mwanza, in Tanzania. She came to America because her parents worked for the American Embassy. And we met in Toronto where my parents were. So we just happened to meet there. Um, and I was coming from Germany to visit my parents. She was visiting my brother, who was a friend of hers in Toronto. <laughs> Uh, so I maybe stole my brother's girlfriend, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, so we met in Toronto and we had this long distance relationship. There was no email, etc., no iPhone. I was letters, by the time you get the letter, things have moved on. Uh, so I think, uh, and then when I came to North America, we met again in North America. She was in New York and I was in uh, Detroit. And I think that relationship that developed in Toronto uh, survived. I got married in New York, which was her home at that time. But they very quickly, we then moved to Detroit, moved to Alabama. Both the kids that I have, my children were born in Alabama. And uh, that became our home for many years. And so she still is in uh, Atlanta, which became our main, main home. And I always try to, you know, people ask, Dr. Saleh, where is your family? Well, my wife lives in Atlanta. That's home for me in many ways. But it, this is my home home now. My children who were born in Alabama, my daughter who is uh, 31 years old, is a nurse practitioner in pediatric oncology. So she takes care of cancer patients who are children. My son is a computer programmer and a project manager. Uh, he does computer science work and software development. They both work with me in the hospital. Uh, I used to take them to the lab on weekends when I was attending and drowning and doing research work but my daughter got the bug for cancer, so she treats pediatric oncology patients. Both my children came to AKU to do an internship for three months. And in fact, my daughter was here when Westgate happened. happened. So they know Africa, not only from my stories, but from really being here. And my hope is that my daughter will come and work at AKU because she's a clinician. My son will contribute a software for AKU. And my hope is that my wife will come back uh, to Kenya to at least, even if not live here, experience uh, life here. You know, when she went back home after about 17 years, went back to Mwanza, Tanzania, things had changed. The home, which was a home, had changed, had become dilapidated. So her experience of Africa, her home, is very different than mine. For me, home is still home. It is still the same Africa I left decades ago. For her, the Africa has changed. So we agree to uh, say, I'll make this my home. I'll come home frequently. I need to make a difference that says I lived to make a difference. But it's true that if my family had not agreed, allowed me this freedom, I could not do this. So their contribution is giving their father, their husband, the freedom to do what he can do. And my contribution is giving back the knowledge that I learned because of that German author who said, I will take care of you. His coming back to Nairobi was following many years of collaborative work, aside from the fact that his connection to Aga Khan dates back to his A-levels. He proposed that if the hospital would be willing to set up a cancer center and a clinical research unit, 
He would give up what he was doing in America to focus on this and build something new. So we did COVID research and proved ourselves, trained our team, and today we're ready to do cancer research. And I think we're about to start a whole series of studies specifically dedicated to cancer research in patients who have cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, esophageal cancer, and prostate cancer. Those are the two main cancers we face here. And there are a number of drugs being developed that I believe would make a difference to our patients in Africa. His goal to understand cancer, a desire to alleviate pain and suffering, and a willingness to rope in as many like-minded people as possible is a driving force behind what he does. The notion of doing research is known to Africa. The notion of cancer research probably is not known because we may not have the expertise. In fact, disease research is being done here significantly. We made headways. The new vaccines for malaria are being developed here. The new vaccines for other infectious diseases are being developed here. So I think research is known. Kemri, very well known worldwide for infectious disease, disease research. But cancer research, not. So I think we have to educate not only our clinicians, our patients, but also our regulatory systems to say, we can do cancer research because it's new to them, new to the reviewers. For the patient, I think research is probably a novelty in many ways. In North America, it says, I don't want to be a guinea pig. And my sense is, you're not a guinea pig. Every drug we are giving you today for diabetes, infectious disease, was a research drug. Someone consented to say, yes, I will try. His motto for research is the drug called hope. My experience around the world has taught me many things. It allows me to understand the pain of the poor and the underserved. And part of my calling here is to really make a difference to those who may be underserved, but to make a difference to the community at, all, at large, to the poor, but also to the rich, because we all suffer the same ailment. And cancer is really an indiscriminatory foe in many ways. He says that his current role in cancer care and research is a way for him to share his knowledge, what he knows and has experienced throughout life. So three things I'd like to do. Establish a cancer research program, a clinical research unit, and a cellular therapy unit. And that requires us to train our own so that we can do it for ourselves, for our patients, which means Kenyans, East Africans, will do the kind of research I do and will treat the patients because I believe we know what ails our patients. We can be much more convincing, but we need help from expatriates from outside because that's where knowledge has been coming from. But we should also be doing research publishing so that we can become the source of knowledge. He says that his current role in cancer care and research is a way for him to share his knowledge, what he knows and has experienced throughout life in order to make a difference. He considers this his contribution and the justification for his existence. Dr. Masi Kurir for KT News Doctor's Diary.